I'm Marianne Sasaki. You're watching Life in the Law, which airs Wednesdays from 1 to 1.30 at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, we, today's a very exciting day in the law because our president uh, nominated his Supreme Court candidate, and we are very, very lucky indeed to have Michael Kozak, eminent legal scholar, eminent Honolulu legal scholar with us to discuss uh, the ramifications of this uh, appointment and what, how do you think it's going to go? Well, hello, Marianne. Thank you for having me on the show. I love having you. Um, yes, Neil Gorsuch was uh, nominated by President Trump. He's still subject to confirmation. It should be interesting. Uh, he's an interesting guy with an interesting past, some interesting parents, and he's been involved on some pretty uh, newsworthy cases as of recent. Yes, so as your re diligent research has showed, which we're going to talk about, which is good, great. But first, we'll talk a little bit about Neil uh, Gorsuch's background. It's Gorsuch. That's how I pronounce yeah. it. I, I'm not I, sure I, I if I'm saying it I believe that's correct. Wrong. So, uh, Mr. Gorsuch went to Columbia, undergrad, and Harvard Law School, and he's got a doctorate from Oxford. He was uh, a judge unanimously voted onto the Tenth Circuit. I don't know what district, I don't know, I don't know about his lower court uh, history. Um, he's apparently very well liked, but he's very much in the mold of Antonin Scalia. And, um, you know, it's my opinion that, you know, the entire ju judicial appointment process has been tortured by the fact that the Senate would not entertain Merrick Garland when it was President Obama's rightful pick. So it, there's a, I say there's a hint of illegitimacy with respect to this appointment, but we'll see how the Senate's going to deal with it. Um, do, you th do, you, do you think the, the advise and consent portion of uh, the hearings, the Senate hearings are going to drag on? Well, it'll be interesting. There was some friction, obviously, between the transition from Obama to Trump. And as you pointed out, the, um, I guess, delay or, well, delay is probably the best way to put it with the prior nomination. But, um, you know, it is the Supreme Court. And as far as I may disagree or agree with what they have to say, I think the process in and of itself you know, is, is inherently uh, good. I don't have any reason to doubt that the, you know, advising and consent will occur in a impartial way. Oh, I think it's going to be a very political fight. I mean, it, it's going to, I think it's going to be a very political fight. And I think that um, the Senate is 58 to 62 now. And I think the, the Democrats are going to filibuster. And I think the Republicans are going to get rid of the filibuster. I don't know. But I just think, how after the, the Bush v. Gore could you think that the Supreme Court is an inherently honest Well, maybe, body. maybe it's wishful thinking. That was the most exciting thing to happen in my administrative law class in law school. It was, was exciting. It was fascinating. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, I have to admit, administrative law, when I went through Pepperdine, was not the most exciting class. But you had I, Bush v. Gore, which made it real. It brought it all to life. It's, you know, you're very smart to have studied administrative law because the, the, we're going to see the wholesale dismantling of all the executive agencies by Bush's cabinet. And you'll be able to bear witness that there actually used to be an EPA and other executive agencies, and, and not, not merely an executive. <laughs> so um, what does what does Neil? You know, I fear what Neil Gorsuch means for the future of the uh, of, of the the uh, precedents set by by the Supreme Court, particularly Roe v. Wade. Um, I was really hoping to have Citizens United overturned. Um, I think this is like probably one of the most impactful things that I hate that word impactful. So let me take that back. One of the most important things that Donald Trump will do during his presidency. The guy's only 49. He's got he could have 50 years on the court. He could shape law for f the future 50 years. So um, I, I'm a little, you know. Dis disappointed in his nomination. I mean, politically, are you a, more aligned with his, his? Are you more on the conservative side? Well, I was, I was raised Catholic, you know, church every Sunday, but I still take the position now, especially with things like contraceptive rights or abortion. Um, it, it really is something I think you should leave up to an individual instead of mandating whether or not you can or cannot 
you know, obtain contraceptive or right, right. Um, I agree. Procure an agree. abortion. It's part there's of your a, right to privacy. Yeah, there's been a variety of laws that I didn't particularly care for that limit that. Um, there was one I remember where you had to have anesthesia if you were undergoing an abortion, and it just seemed to be like you're imposing political views and religious views into what really is essentially um, a personal choice. Yeah, and it's also a, like a medical procedure. Right. So, I, you know, I, I don't think it's something that you should abuse it or use that. No, no, you know, not at all, but it's... But having a government step in... And say you can't, cannot. It seems to be a little bit much. You know, I, it's, I'll tell you, you know what this guy, um, this guy, this, the Supreme Court nominee, has written extensively about um, uh, the right to death, and, and he's vehemently um, opposed to people, the right for people to choose to die, which leads me to think, just from a logic consistent point he's going to be opposed opposed to abortion too because if 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 you value life in such a way and he's kind of a religious guy so if, if you value life in such a way I, I just don't see how um, he can vote with with you know he can he cannot vote with cutting further into Roe v Wade I, I, I they say that the, the court Roe v Wade is safe right now but if um, one of the other um, one of the other uh, liberal Supreme Court justice goes, like um, like Justice Ginsburg, who is I think 84 years old. Mm -hmm. Then that's like pretty much curtains for for uh, legalized abortion in the country. So it's kind of, it's it's really I think we're really at the precipice of something uh, something monumentally big here. I, you, the, the 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 whole tenor of the court could change. Yeah, well I would agree. It seems like his background. Um, is more pro-life, regardless of the circumstance. Um, I know he authored um, some type of publication about being a opponent of assisted suicide right, in exactly. Indonesia. Um, it, something like that to me seems to be, as, as attorneys we always get, this is a case-by-case -case analysis. This is you know, not a bright line rule. We have to do these determinations and uh, part of my practice is employment law, and that has that's filled with case by case. Right, it's totally fact specific. Yeah. Well, I, I take the same position with assisted suicide or euthanasia. I agree. I mean, if you are of sound mind and you're terminally ill and you're scared half to death, I don't think there should be a government regulation that says I can't choose to take my own life. I I agree, but th this I, I like to read. I, I haven't had a chance to read this paper, but I'd like very much to read this paper because it's kind of why would a judge opine on this? Is this 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 doesn't seem to be a burning issue in the courts, and it's an interesting interesting uh, choice of subject matter for him. Um, I think it belies a certain uh, religiosity. I, I'll see when when I read it, and uh, we'll we'll know you know we'll know for sure what 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 propels him what's what's the thing that makes him tick so bearing in mind you're the host and i'm not supposed to be asking questions i'll, I'll throw question. one out any question you got um how do you think neil is going to rule or feel about all of the immigration issues that we're seeing flooded in the news as of Donald Trump's well, inauguration. You know, that's really interesting because I have a bone to pick with President Obama about that and President Bush. And this is that. President Bush and Pres President Obama expanded the executive, the power of the executive office so greatly as to make it possible for a president to do nearly anything. Now, I'm opposed to the executive order which bans immigrants from those specific countries that Donald Trump signed last week. And you're not alone. There's protests. Over no, there's airports protests. Everywhere. It just came from a protest. Go out and protest if you if you if you get involved. I, you know, frankly, I'm not going to tell you how to get involved, but just get involved. Um, but I think he'll vote. I, I think that he'll vote to uphold the executive order. I don't think. I don't think that um, the president is acting. Oh, get this. This can be a great word. Ultra virus. Oh know, boy. I, <laughs> outside so the, now. the scope of his of, of outside the scope of his uh, responsibility. So you know, um, and. He's, you know, he's an originalist, right? We talked about yes. this. He's a textualist, just like Scalia was. And, you know, some people, like myself, think the 
Constitution is a living, breathing document and that it's of the people, by the people, and for the people, and it, it continues to grow as our consciousness and our culture grow. But he doesn't believe that. No. He liked to get into the minds of a, a few uh, guys from the, what, 16th century, 17th century. And you know, I have a no, hard time 18th century. with that approach, um, only because of what I do, what we do. You know, as an attorney, yes, you're supposed to be an advocate for your client. You're supposed to, you know, be diligently working and doing things. But at the end of the day, you also need an ability to take things in context and take a... There is no context with yourself, textualism. Yeah. They're like, this word is this word, this word is that word. And, you know, it's implicitly, I think it's inherently uh, biased toward con the conservative viewpoint because it's, it's just by its, the very nature of its practice is, like, not changing. We're not going to change anything. So so if, if we really were pure originalists, pure textualists with respect to the Constitution, I mean, lots of people wouldn't be able to vote right now. It's true. You know, so... It's uh, it's an it's an inherently conservative uh, uh, stance to take, um, interpretive stance to take. But tell me, you know a little bit about one of um, uh, Justice? Well, he's a judge still, right? Yeah, yes. Justice Groshall. Groshall. I I say Gorsuch. Gorsuch. I don't well, know if Groshall I'm is certainly not pronouncing it Just, wrong, but you know something about one of his really important decisions, which is the Hobby Lobby case. Yeah, that was in the news pretty prominently, and the whole thrust of the case was, um, it was Tenth Circuit, and Neil Gorsuch upheld an employer's religious beliefs for closely held corporations, and disagreed with the mandate in Obamacare, where employers had to cover contraceptives. In particular, for Hobby Lobby, this was um, like the morning after Plan B type right. pill because right. the employer had a religious background, was opposed to abortion, and under Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act was being mandated to provide health coverage for a religious, um, well, what he viewed as a religious act that he was opposed to. So he came out, stood against it, the case only applies to closely held corporations. So you're publicly traded and all the, so all the bigger very, ones. Yeah, it narrow. is pretty narrow, but the significance of it is recognizing an employer's religious right to refuse certain contraceptive coverage for a viewpoint they disagree with. Uh, another case that... Wait, well, let me take a quick break and we'll, we'll go on to talk about some of his other cases, which Great. I find fascinating. Um, I'm Marian Sasaki. We'll, you're watching Life in the Law. We'll be back in one minute. Hey, has your signal just been taken over or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, Kako. I'm Marcia Joyner, and I'm inviting you to navigate the journey. We are discussing the end-of-life options, and we would really love to have you every Wednesday morning at 11 a.m. right here. My name is Mark Shklov, and I'm the host of Law Across the Sea. And Law Across the Sea is a program that brings attorneys who have traveled across the sea and live in Hawaii or are staying in Hawaii for a time to talk about their travels, where they're from, where they're going, and bring it all together because really we're all connected some way, although we travel across the sea. So I hope that you'll tune in and watch our program. Thank you very much. Welcome back. You're watching Life in the Law. I'm delighted today to have Michael Kozak on. Uh, and Michael was just uh, discussing the ramifications of the uh, Hobby House case. Hobby House? Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby case. And tell me, what was his reasoning that a, a company could have religious beliefs. I mean, did because because it was a, uh, a closely held corporation, yeah. so it was, really the company was no different than the person that owned it. Well, that essentially seemed to be the line of reasoning that he went down. Um, again, it's only for closely held corporations. Right. And it reminded me as I was perusing the opinion. It reminded me of the um, opposition to Chick Fil A. The founder of Chick-fil-A came out against 
I think he said he was a traditional marriage type right, person. Right, he was, he was anti-LGBT. Yeah. And, plus. you know, that organization is closed on Sunday and observes uh, Christian holidays. Um, it, it reminded me a lot of this case as a different shift in thinking. Right. And when you think about a business, um, you know, who is the government to tell a business how it should or should not be run in the sense where if you're like the founder, I think Truett Cathy was the name of the Chick-fil-A guy, if you believe that your business should close on Sunday for your religious beliefs, and you're the one that really suffers, well, you know, you, know, you lose the day of business, it, I, I understand what you're saying. You, you should have the ability to do that if you want. But they're operating in a country in which um, we don't discriminate against uh, members of the LGBTQ com community, and Hobby Lobby is operating in, in a country and taking subsidies, I'm certain, from a government who provides that it's a fundamental right of a woman to have an abortion. So, I mean, I yes, I understand what you're saying, and I understand what uh, Grosetch is saying, but I, I, I just don't agree. I just don't agree. It it's a big step in legal land for the Hobby Lobby case to exist. But I think it gives, so. It That's gives a, a company a religious opening. basis yeah, yeah. to choose to do something other than what you know is typically provided for in the law. It also rings of the separation of church and state. You know, right. It seems to be like it tri it's, it's not trickling in. It's trickling yeah. in. Yeah. So tell me about other uh, opinions he's written. Well, another case, uh, this was Pleasant Grove, Pleasant Grove v. Summum. Uh, that was the case where a government displayed the Ten Commandments, and there was opposition that if you're displaying a Christian icon, that you should also display other religion right. icons. Like, and, a, like Christmas tree, menorah, yeah. whatever, Kwanzaa it, That's tree, what it whatever. reminded me of. Right. You know, I, I saw a TV show once where um, there was like a children's play and all of religion was taken out of the Christmas play and it just was this bizarre type of thing right. getting off track. He had ruled that by displaying the Ten Commandments, the government's not required to also display other religious monuments, which again, you know, that Seems That's interesting. I wonder, I wonder what his reasoning was. Do you think his reasoning was that the Ten Commandments are so universal, they, they, they're like supersede religion, they're actually not even a, a religious they're not even religious iconography because that's how how uh, important and 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 relevant they are for the law and how I mean I imagine that's what what he primarily is yeah. it was almost like it's 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 not even a religious it's not yeah. like a Christmas tree or menorah it's not it's not rooted in any single religion it reminded me of copyright law when you'd see something in the public domain meaning you can use whatever portion of it that you want without having to pay any sort of royalty or fee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it right, seemed it, to me, when I was reading it, it reminded me of that. Yes, it's a happy birthday yeah. of, of uh, religious icons. Pretty much. It's pervasive. It's all pervasive, and it's, and it's lost its impact as um, an overtly religious icon. But, okay, now, you know, I know I've been pointing, uh, I've been uh, positing uh, this uh, poor, poor judge who's going to be the next Supreme Court justice, um, uh, you know, as anti all this material and very conservative. And um, But he, he actually did come out on the right side of one opinion. And tell us about that opinion, because this, I, I find this, I find this fascinating. Well, it was a 2016 case and involved a minor child and a lawsuit was bought by the minor child, by their guardian, against um, Ann Holmes was the defendant, but it really was against a policy where if a kid burps in class, that that is punishable by jail time. Where was this, the Tenth Circuit. Know? It was Tenth Circuit. Tenth Circuit. I don't recall what state off the top of my head, but um, he came down after his analysis. I, I thought it was funny that a case involving burping would ever get to the Supreme yes. Court. Yes, well, we love burping here in I mean, life of the law. <laughs> we, can, we, we, we love burp law, you know. Uh, burp with impunity. <laughs> so I just wondered of all the against, problems. Uh, he was the dissent in that. Yes, and he, he dissented by basically saying something that's ordinarily a disruption and not a threat to safety or health, but a disruption in the classroom cannot be criminalized. But the majority rule that burping could be criminalized? Under the statutory scheme, yes. Wow. I guess uh, disruptive. Well, I mean, schools anymore, you know, when you and I went to school, 
Um, there were no metal detectors. There were no guns. I didn't know right. any kids that brought guns to school. Um, you know, I did go to a private grade school, but I was friends with all the kids in the neighborhood who went to the public school. And they didn't have any friends bringing guns or knives or you didn't have police officers in school. You didn't go through like searching and some things. So times certainly have changed since I was a kid. And it seems as though schools are now a zone where there's a lot less control over what happens um, to the point where you have police involved in day-to-day -day activities. You know, kids have no civil rights. I always, I, this, I, I, I discuss this constantly with people. Children have virtually no civil rights in our country. I mean, and they should. They should have civil rights, you know. Um, it, it's, I, you know, I, I'd say the state should beware because, you know, the, the things that happen to the least among us, like children, it always sort of goes up a notch. There's more control. And we've seen it over the past 30 years, an increasing in amount of government control over areas that mm -hmm. we, like whether personal decisions about abortion or um, uh, Citizens United allowing, you know, large pack money to flow into presidential candidates. So, you know, it's, you know, we, we've seen, we've seen the, uh, the encroachment of, of religion. And I, I'm afraid, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I'm afraid Donald Trump is going to be the real embodiment of that kind of uh, unilateral, singular, dictatorial, um, encroachment on people's rights. So I don't well, I'm curious to see what happens with states like California or states that have these sanctuary cities with immigration that you've seen in the news. I'd be curious to see how the judicial nominee would opine and rule, but more the reasoning than the ruling. Um, but I'd also be curious to see what happens to, like California, immigrants have a wide variety of rights, including you know attending public school and a, a, a wide variety of states' rights. Uh, I'll be curious to see what happens with that. Right. And if this justice gets an opinion, sooner or later I have to think one of these sanctuary cities in light of the immigration executive order is going to file some kind of claim or lawsuit to invalidate it or just break it. Right. You know, we have the guy on, I think it was in Florida, the mayor or governor had said, yes, we're going to enforce this even though I disagree with it. Right. And then you have places like San Francisco where they're just openly disobeying. Right. You know, if that really is enforced, you know, it is an executive order, it's now law. Um, you're breaking the law of San Francisco, what are we going to do about it? Right. So I'd be curious to see what um, Neil Gorsuch would do with a case like I, that. I think Donald Trump is, I, I don't even think that he's going to wait, wait for uh, a case to come up um, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the executive, immigration executive order. I think he's going to sign a whole new executive order tr uh, banning sanctuary cities. I, I, I think he's going to you know, address that head on. And if that happens, that's just an explosive. It is. And it begs the question, how would enforcement be accomplished? Are you going to send state police to Please enforce? State. Please state. And if we're the state says, yes, we'll enforce this, and then wink, wink, no, we're not, do you send in, you know, federal authorities? Yes. This is what's very, it's, apparently it's very, very important for a large segment of our country to monitor people that uh, have come into this country without the right papers. It's like it's significantly important. Yeah. And, but, not, but not so important as to monitor businesses that hire illegal la labor as, and, and treat them in, inconsistently with the uh, labor regulations as that stand. That's of less interest. But actual people who are trying to live their lives, there's a lot of interest in policing such people. Yeah. And you know, I, I have to say, you know, you're younger than I am, but I remember before 9-11, and I, I'll tell you, since 9-11, police power, whether it's the state police or local police, or it has has just grown. Oh, I mean, tremendously. It's, 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 it, it, the, 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 uh, Local police forces are militarized, and they have like yeah. they can unilaterally do really mu pretty much what they want. So that's what I'm imagining. They'll have rounding up of people. That's I, what, I hope that's not. What Hitler did. But well, Hitler managed it very nicely. Uh, 
hopefully that doesn't happen, but it'll be interesting to see when a case comes up, how this particular uh, nominee, assuming he gets confirmed, rules. The other item that has been in the news, uh, another subject of an executive order, was the Dakota pipeline. Right. So that has been a pretty hot button issue, whether or not you're going to complete that thing, right. and have, have it transfer all the oil and with all the risk of leaks and all the leaks that have occurred already. It'll be interesting to see how this particular justice views that. Right. I, 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 I have to tell you that I, while he may be only, he, he, he is a milder, he may be a milder version of, of Justice Alito or Justice Roberts. He's, I, I, think, I think I know how he would, how he would rule in the, these instances. I think, I think he's going to go, you know, completely with the conservative um, party line because it seems that the Supreme Court is, polit is, a, is no longer above the law, above, I mean, above politics. Yeah. It's part of politics. Well, and that was the criticism recently um, that politics is influencing and, and taking over a portion of the judiciary. Isn't that, that, doesn't that break your heart? Because, you know, you learn in law school that the, the judiciary is above, it, it, it's such mundane, yeah. uh, you know, uh, matters. That they're, they're really uh, concerned with great, 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 great ideas, great matters of great import for the co country, not who will be in office or who won't be in office or what, what party or another party. Their, their, their great projects are uh, desegregating schools yeah. and stuff like that. And now, well, law school, as I reflect on it, seemed to put things very black and white. Um, it seemed like there was a, a particular answer or a right answer the teacher may have been looking for. But when you get into practice, and I'm now 12 years in, uh, you start to see very little is black and white, uh, right. if any. You know, you have a particular position, someone else takes an opposite position. Um, you know, we've seen it as recently as the inauguration where you know, Trump is disputing the number of people that attended, and you look at the Obama picture and the Trump picture, and one, unless I'm crazy, clearly has less. It, why are we disputing that? It, well, you know, you, you're a litigator. You should know why we're disputing that, because we, we as lawyers can take any side yeah. and make an argument for oh, any side. Oh, I've seen that. Michael is a great litigator. You should look up some of his work. You have some, um, I know you've, you've given some seminars and I so have. on. And what's the name of your firm? Porter, McGuire, Keokona, and Chow. Well, thank you, Michael Kozak of Porter McGuire. I'm going to stop it there, because I'll okay. mangle the rest. Okay. And I appreciate your coming today to talk about uh, this uh, very important day in history, frankly. Pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invite. That's great.